In this presentation, making discoveries through research, needy free students, perceptions of their role when caring for pregnant women who misuse substances, neonatal stimulators as creative pedagogy. The presentation is being done by Dr. Luisa, the city butler, and Dr. Humira Hussein. Luisa has been a midwife for 30 years. Prior to that, was a nurse and underwent her training in South Africa. She undertook her midwifery training in the UK in 1988 and qualified in 1990. She's currently a senior lecturer in midwifery in Bournemouth University and lectures at undergraduate and postgraduate levels, including masters. Her scholarship in practice is focused on newborn issues and is the lead at the university in relation to examination of the newborn, an area of practice that was once predominantly undertaken by pediatricians, but has now been largely reclaimed by midwives as an essential part of normal midwifery care. Her research interests are around preterm infants and women's experiences. Her PhD study explored women's experiences of caring for a late preterm infant from a feminist perspective. She considers herself a radical feminist. Kumira Hussein is a lecturer in health sciences at Bournemouth University and interim deputy head of nursing. She has a strong academic and research background in health, clinical, and educational psychology. She completed a doctorate in professional practice between 2004 and 2010, looking at the impact of job strain and burnout from the inclusion of disruptive students in mainstream teaching with secondary school teachers. This has led into more health education and promotion research based around the use of interactive digital technology in health and social care settings. She's the lead researcher on a number of research projects in Bournemouth University Center of Midwifery, uh, Maternal and Prenatal Health, working in collaboration with Bournemouth University, Science, Technology, and Pool Hospital, NHS Foundation Maternity Services. Welcome, Luisa and Hibira. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Welcome, everybody, to our presentation. Um, uh, I'd just like to say that this is one part of a bigger study we undertook, which uh, the other part, which was a survey that we uh, focus, uh, that we put for the students looking around FAS and DAS pre and post lecture. And that research will be published in another journal. We looked at social work um, and other uh, students as well. We're going to compare and contrast midwifery students with other students in the, in the faculty at Bournemouth University and uh, University of Solent and near Southampton. So before we start, could we have the next slide? I would like to ask you a few questions. Maybe we uh, don't have spent too much time on, on answering them if you don't want to. Um, Carol, can you move the slide? So am I going to move the slide over? Next slide, okay. So what is the risk of harm to the baby if a woman has drunk only small amounts of alcohol before she knew she was pregnant or during pregnancy? Any answers to that? Would you like them to have it in the public chat? Yeah, they can just just um, just so, you know, a few words. So, for example, no safe limits. Um, the risk of harm, as opposed to the safe limits. What is the risk of harm? What is a small amount? Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Well, we can come back to that. Unknown, we counsel against any alcohol. Research changes its mind. Yes, that's true. Actually, the risk of harm is likely to be low, according to the evidence. Um, are there any barriers that prevent or inhibit you from advising pregnant women to abstain from alcohol? No, says Linda. Language. Nope, says Debbie. Nope. Okay, brilliant. So you're quite happy to talk to women um, in terms of discussing. The research does suggest that some midwives are inhibited in giving advice, which is interesting. 
Did you receive any education in alcohol and pregnancy during your undergrad training? No. Nope. Yes. Small amount. Yes. Lots. Great. Nope. Denise King. Okay. Lovely. So mixed picture there. And so how many hours of education did you receive? Some more pertinent to psychosocial and fetal effects. For example, in our university, we only do one session, really, in relation to the effects. So the, the hours are not huge. Whole module. Fantastic, Linda. We need to link up. Okay, so let's talk about the, uh, the background to the study. We know from research that pregnant women are offered conflicting advice from midwives in relation to alcohol during pregnancy. So the research suggests that midwives reported wanting more information on teratogens, uh, the effect of teratogens on fetal development. So we also know that uh, the uh, education around FAS, for example, appears to be not standardized. And uh, research recommends that midwives need to expand on their knowledge to, um, ex to be confident in their knowledge around the effects of alcohol to improve on antelope advice. As can be seen from the slide, advice from official bodies is also conflicting. So how do women and midwives navigate through this minefield? The chief medical officer, uh, 2016 says for women who do drink the amount uh, that small amount the risk to their baby is likely to be low but nevertheless we cannot rule out the risks altogether when we did some ppi which is some uh, spoke to some midwives i was teaching recently they had never heard of the cmo guidelines so what advice are midwives giving to women the general consensus is that no level of alcohol is safe. So recent research uh, by Scholl and Etard in 2019 uh, discovered that 69% of midwives had received fewer than four hours of alcohol training pre-qualification. 19% had received none and only thirds of the midwives provided information about the effects of alcohol consumption in pregnancy to pregnant women. So that goes back to my original question, why on, are the midwives not giving information to women? There are some barriers to that information provision. There's a similar picture in relation to illicit drug use during pregnancy. So we do know that it's challenging for both midwives and student midwives to care for these women. And they are, we need to be uh, empowering our students to have this knowledge before they qualify. Uh, again, research has indicated that women who misuse alcohol and drugs find it challenging to engage with maternity services, fearing judgmental attitudes from the midwives, negativity, and also hostile environments. Stark attitudes matter more than the medical care received. So all these important points highlight the importance of midwives feeling confident in the provision of care, uh, information on substance misuse during pregnancy, and that this should start at undergrad level. Hamira. Thank you very much. Lovely. Okay, on this slide we talk about um, what happened uh, and the use of simulators, which is my area of expertise. So what we found from looking at our research was that within the undergraduate midwifery curriculums, lots of um, teaching strategies have been put forward recently where simulation has been used in terms of OSCEs and, and other formats. And they're used to enable students to gain the relevant knowledge and skills around safe women-centered care. So that's uh, wonderful news to hear. Um, and within that, sort of the idea of different types of simulators can come forward. And there's um, there's a wealth of research around uh, the different types. Um, so they range from static or low fidelity, we call them LFS, medium fidelity, um, MFS, or fully interactive high fidelity simulators. Um, 
Okay, right. So basically, just give you an example, then I was doing some research with the high fidelity simulators um, at um, a local school in this in, in the UK. And um, the high fidelity simulators were basically full, full born neonates, uh, which teenage students took away home to practice practical parenting. And it worked. It was fabulous. The students understood the difficulties of being a teenage mother. And, um, and on the whole, understood the importance of contraception and other factors about sexual relations and the need to carry on with their education. And so the use of the simulator was very, very effective. And they did educate school students in a practical method, a, a practical pedagogical tool for teenage parenting. So in that respect, both low fidelity and high fidelity have been used in different situations and have been highly valued by nursing students and also assist them to develop safe practice with increased self-efficacy. So really within midwifery, the simulation based learning is definitely gaining momentum and we're very pleased about that. And um, according to Vermeulen in 2016, and really, it's all about developing clinical skills in a safe environment where you're not actually harming or addressing a patient straight away, uh, but you're looking at obstetric emergencies um, in a safe environment. Uh, so basically, um, we're looking at simulation as a vital pedagogical resource to help midwifery core skills and proficiencies in that safe environment. And in that respect, it improves the confidence for the midwife um, in terms of practice skills, improves the quality of maternity care. And it's a really, really effective pedagogical method um, to use with students. Um, however, we do recognise, and a lot of researchers have recognised the idea, it cannot replace clinical practice. Um, you do need to be in front of the, the woman and have the understanding of the holistic women-centred care, which is obviously central to midwifery. Um, however, uh, lots of research, and we also advocate this, that the use of simulators tends to bridge the gap between simulation and life practice. And therefore, that's what we and myself as a healthcare researcher are interested in doing. So, um, so basically, in just talking about um, this in recognition of real, the real world impact of the mother and the baby, lots of researchers have recommended that the undergraduate midwifery curricula should address midwifery students' knowledge with the aim of improving the quality of antenatal advice given and the support which will lead to better prevention, intervention, recognition of the signs and symptoms of disorders like fetal alcohol syndrome and that of drug misuse. And what we found is that there was a gap in the, in the literature about the use of neonate simulators, in particular the FAS and DAS dolls, uh, which is my area of interest and in research. And so Louisa and I got together and conducted this research. So there is this gap, as we've said, um, in the midwifery education and the student midwife knowledge in relation to understanding the impact of teratogens on fetal development, as well as the short term impact on the newborn baby. Um, and the dolls are amazing. They're really interesting. Um, and we'll talk about that in, in the following slides. Um, and as I say, there's been minimal research using those dolls and having students interact with the neonatal simulators in, in the form of creative pedagogy. And that's why we feel that our research is so novel, it's new, it's not been done before, and we're very excited to share that with you. So in terms of our objectives then, we enabled our midwifery students here shown in the picture uh, to interact with the fetal alcohol and the drug affected neonate simulators as a means of co-constructing their knowledge. We want to understand what their perception of handling the doll from a kinesthetic perspective was. Um, it was really important to gain their experiences and their understanding around, around that and also to understand what they, uh, they kind of gained from the understanding of substance misuse during pregnancy and postnatally. So in terms of our methods then, um, we obviously gained ethical approval from our university. Uh, 50 female year one midwifery students were uh, rolled up to do the study. They were involved in a lecture um, on protecting the newborn. They were third of the way through their first year of the undergraduate curriculum. Uh, and they were approached by Louisa being the lead midwife there on the letter of invitation and participation information sheet. Um, I then, when they all signed up, I then stepped in and ran a talk session on protecting the unborn environment uh, where they interacted with the simulators and there were lots of different planned activities were undertaken. 
And it was really a qualitative approach to data gathering uh, being undertaken. So really, we did gain their verbal and non-verbal consent. Um, they interacted with the dolls. There were lots of different activities, including post-it notes and Padlet questions. Okay, so just going to finish off. So post-it note activity questions were around educating pregnant women on drug and alcohol misuse and the impact of the baby. The Padlet was an online resource. Students could uh, look at the hyperlink and go on and answer questions about their knowledge on teratogenic impacts to fetal development and their future role as the midwife. So in this slide, we've got the we took a picture of our dolls, the neonate simulators. Um, the the arrow is pointing to the static doll. It's a non-interactive fetal alcohol simulator doll. It's a low fidelity simulator, uh, but it's demonstrating the impact of the effect of alcohol on a newborn baby. And um, yeah, and then on the side we've got next to it we have the Daz doll demonstrating the neonate abstinence syndrome, and both of these dolls are manufactured by Reality Works in America. Okay, so the Faz doll, as, as illustrated um, by the the picture here, um, illustrates typical facial features um, that a newborn or a child would develop um, in the womb, and then would would have that permanent feature um, as that um, as they grow up. And the typically um, the typical sort of characteristics are the thin upper lip, or known as the philtrum. Uh, the, the lips are very, very thin. Um, they have small eyelid profusions, um, and um, you know these are the three main characteristics of um, of a child growing up with FAS or born with FAS. Um, and obviously FAS um, can be mild to very, very extreme. It's, it's a, there's a spectrum of FAS, but fully blown FAS, you're gonna end up with all three of these facial features and deformities um, as is illustrated in the picture here. Okay, uh, the drug affected doll um, is basically a medium fidelity doll with an on off switch back and um, and the idea behind the doll, um, I will just play a recording. Actually, if I hope, hope you can hear this, it's, it's, there's a shrill cry that comes from the doll. Um, basically, it's a, patial, a painful facial expression. They emit a cry of drug-affected baby suffering from neonate abstinence syndrome, a withdrawal. And the withdrawal symptoms, are you, by turning on the switch, um, which is located on the back, you can then have um, a very, very shrill cry. So I have this on my mobile phone, but it's um, quite low. So I'll, I'll put it near my mic, see if it works. <laughs> Okay, so I hope you heard that. So this was a recording. I, I made a small video. Um, um, for, I didn't bring the, the actual dolls home with me on the, on the lockdown, which is such a shame. But basically, when you turn the switch on, the, um, the doll emits this very shrill, painful cry. And um, it is um, quite difficult to sort of handle. And also, the, the doll vibrates continuously, uh, mimicking the idea of the withdrawal symptoms. And it can be quite horrible to see. Okay, Louise, over to you. Okay, brilliant. So we had a six stage framework offered by Braun and Clark and we used, which we used to thematically analyze the students' uh, commentaries from the taught session activities. Both Himera and I uh, coded the, or analyzed it independently and came together and met up to discuss preliminary findings. The codes were then codified into themes by examining in-depth patterns and similarities. And basically, we had three broad uh, findings or three broad themes, which were identified as kinesthetic learning in their shoes and midwifery role in educating others. I don't have the, um, I can't move it on. Can somebody move it on for me? Okay. So the first major theme is the kinesthetic uh, learning. And the majority of student responses indicated that they valued interacting with both neonatal simulators and the simulators appeared to enhance their knowledge, as the quotes demonstrate. In addition, the students were easily able to identify the features of a baby affected by FAS by using the following terminology, thin upper lip, protruding lips mouth, prominent forehead, flat nose, lack of a philtrum, small and skinny. 
And finally, switching the DAS doll button enabled the students to hear the shrill cry and feel the tremors. A quote from a student was, hearing the doll crying had an impact on learning and made me think more about the importance of educating women. Next slide, please. So this uh, theme is called In Their Shoes. And within this theme, students appeared to demonstrate higher order thinking as they were able to simulate how the teratogens would impact on the child in the long term, such as when going to school and on the family in terms of medical care. And the, three, the first three quotes illustrate this thinking from the students. The students were also aware of their role and responsibility when considering the impact that teratogens may have on the woman herself and the fetus. And you can see from the last quote where they're thinking, do be sensitive, do not judge or make them feel bad. And, and as well as to be aware of the signs and symptoms to be able to identify a baby suffering withdrawal, perhaps for a mother who hasn't disclosed substance abuse. Next slide, please. And finally, in this theme, other students weren't so willing to put themselves into the shoes of women by stating that the simulators could be used as a visual shock to, as a visual aid to shock pregnant women. These two quotes uh, uh, really illustrate um, what's happened there. These two quotes really illustrate uh, the shock tactics that the student thought might work with women. And we can talk about that a bit later on in relation to um, some follow-up research that we are going to do. Next slide, please. And finally, the, the third theme was midwifery role in educating others. So this overall theme had two sub or well, several sub-themes which are related to using the simulators to educate a wider audience around the impact of substance misuse during pregnancy. So one of the sub-themes is around visual aid to enhance knowledge. So for example, the students had some suggestions to use the simulators to educate women starting at school level. Um, so, um, you know, some students felt that it was too late when the women were pregnant to start talking about fares and dares. And many students identified that the knowledge around the impact of teratogens needed to be known long before the woman was planning for pregnancy, including education in schools and colleges. And also, if use the dolls for specialized services such as use the simulators to educate women at the pregnancy booking visit and also at antenatal classes. Next slide please. Humera? Yep that's fine thank you. Okay so in this discussion then the students we found that they students engaged better in the talk session um, really due to this kinesthetic Im impact and the effect of being able to hold and touch and feel and listen to the simulators it made the lesson so much more rewarding there was so much more student engagement it was the almost I would say that one of the best sessions I'd run in terms of teaching um, they really their, their um, the student engagement was just off the scale it was amazing. So the lots of comments were coming out verbally and and in their responses on the Padlet and through posted activities that they could really appreciate the physical, the behavioural and the psychological impact for the baby. Students felt quite scared in a way to hold that the Daz doll and and turn the switch on and feel the vibrations which have and the tremors which are quite severe when you're holding the baby and and then to them for them to think that this is actually a recording of a live baby with that situation was quite heartening you know disheartening for them and they really felt quite a lot of empathy um, towards children born with these this in this problem so and they thought about the developing child and what would happen in school and bullying and um you know how they make friends and what their social life be and how would their physical uh, physical demeanor what it, what it would look like and and how it impact on the family and the, the finance and so there was a lots of discussion about socio-psychological determinants within um the because of the impact of faz and daz on on the baby 
Um, and so one of the questions we asked them really was to look at what, how would you help um, a family with the situation? What would you do now to educate the public and, and people around you, your peers? So lots of ideas were given forward. They included providing information video, putting it into antenatal waiting rooms, targeting young people at secondary school, visual aids to helping pregnant women, uh, basically trying to increase the, stu um, the pregnant woman's knowledge um, by having lots of different ways of like video and pamphlets and leaflets and and um, giving them physically giving them the dolls to hold lots of really interesting and valid discussions were held by the students okay thank you Hamira. Uh, one of the other um uh, discussion points that we uh, uh put forward was that many students wondered why the FAS simulator was static and not interactive as compared to the DAS simulator which obviously, as Humera has said, cried and had tremors. Um, Humera herself had a similar finding in research which she undertook with teenagers, who and she used those uh, um, proper dolls, uh, baby dolls, and were and were considered to be high fidelity baby simulators. The students did state that the simulator was nothing like a real baby and not realistic. In our study, however, the neonatal simulators appear to provide the first year students with a realistic clinical picture, as Humira has alluded to, and was an original of increasing their confidence in the provision of information should they have access to women at the booking visit and, and should they or possibly disclose any substance abuse. Um, in terms of the, um, the shock element uh, around um, the use of the dolls, many many students were able to put themselves into the, into the shoes of these women and empathize with it this with the situation. But um, the ones who wanted to shock the woman felt that talking about it was not good enough. That you actually had to show them the uh, the impact of substance misuse during pregnancy, um, and that would be much. They felt that would be much more uh, impactful for the woman. Um, however, if you look at research by Scholl and et al., the more experienced qualified midwives become, the notion of using shock tactics is overridden by building more trusting relationships as a way to tackle these issues. So therefore, we felt that first-year student midwives are still in the early stages of learning how to communicate in a person-centered manner framework with pregnant women who misuse substances. And this shock tactic is one of the um, uh, areas we're going to be following up in the next stage, stage of our research to ask the student midwife who are now in their second year as to whether they would still think about using a shock tactic to um, you know inform women about the problem and then finally as Mahumira said they uh, student midwives could, could think refractive reflectively about their role in the future to help and educate pregnant women as prevention is key. And um, many students realized that once the signs of FAS or DAS were recognized, then the damage had already been done and all they could do is be supportive and compassionate to those women. Next slide. Okay. So in terms of our conclusion then, um, you know, we really emphasise the idea of involving your students as researchers in the, in the development of their own knowledge and the importance of interacting with the simulators. Um, it was a very effective form of creative pedagogy and, and the students, I, I can't tell you how much they appreciated that lesson and they really had such a big impact on them. Um, it was a really good method for enhancing their knowledge and uh, as a means of building new knowledge. So using the, the dolls in relation to the talk session from the PowerPoint and having interactive activities like the post-it note and the Padlet really enlivened that lesson. Students were so much more engaged. It was, a, it was an excellent um, teaching um, session actually. And, and what we found was that um, our research helped bridge that disconnect between the teaching and the research and the practice. Students began to really reflect about how they would help others and what their future roles as midwives would be. And it um, it really uncovered some, um, you know, a couple of um, sensitive issues really about themselves. They began to reflect about their own pregnancies and a couple of students actually revealed to me that they, they did drink during their pregnancy and they were concerned about their child. And so um, it, it was just really important 
for them. And I kept emphasizing the fact that this was not about them. It was about their future and future pregnant women. And it was, um, you know, it was good knowledge gained to help others and educate family members and others around them um, and to carry that on in the future. And um, it was really interesting because uh, Louise's slide about the, um, the guidelines about the alcohol consumption were in some cases quite conflicting. Uh, we found that the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists said that, you know, if you limited it to um, one glass per week for three months, you were okay. Um, and then some others were saying that no, no alcohol at all was relevant. So when we presented that information about FAS and DAS uh, to the students, they understood uh, that the, the latest guidelines about no alcohol at all during pregnancy is really important. And then using the dolls or some format um, in pre-conceptual understanding of education is really important. So that was really effective. Um, the, the point also is that the use of these simulators were able to bridge the known theory practice gap because the neonatal simulators can be used to prepare students to confront situations that they may only face when qualified. Obviously, when they're students, they're working under the provision of their qualified uh, practice and so they're not going to be doing masses of interventions in the early stages but and that they may never come across a woman and depending on the area that they're working in they may never see a woman who has misused substances so in a way they can they can build on the knowledge that they use that they learned in their first year to help them in their in their future role as midwife so the next part of our study aims to capture whether this whether the students remember the teaching from from and the use of the simulators for, uh, and knowledge retention, and also whether they've been able to use the knowledge that they gained in practice and whether there were any barriers in relation to using the knowledge whilst practicing. Um, and we're also going to do a, a run at, at the same time, a speak to third year students and ask them about um, their knowledge around uh, educating women in relation to mis mis uh, misuse of substances. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pand pandemic has put a, a bit of a stop onto our research because we were hoping to do focus groups with our students. But now we're going to have to try and do all that online. And many of our third year students are going into practice. So whereas before they were a captive audience, now they're sort of spreading their wings. And hopefully we're going to try and get them to come and partake in our online focus groups. And we're going to finish off with a couple of questions for the audience again. Uh, would you find it acceptable to use the simulators at any point in the antenatal period to explore FAS and DAS with women? If you, if no, could you explain why just briefly? So we've been a, a sort of a, a varied response to questions. So we have some yes, some no. Um, we have made a good case for the use of neonatal simulators. I think um, I think what we'd like to do is to ask, maybe do a little focus group with women and ask them what they think about those, uh, those two simulators and whether it would be uh, helpful for them to see the effects of alcohol and to hear the effects of uh, drug withdrawal. Um, uh, someone who's worked in neonatal intensive care, and I've worked with babies who are withdrawing, it is quite traumatic for both women and carer to, ex to see and experience those kind of effects. So it needs to be, um, I think we need to talk to women before we think about um, a video, because Himera and I are also thinking about a short video in relation to using the dolls to demonstrate the effects. 
Absolutely. So, um, so that the, the idea of the video is to sort of provide some screens that can go out either on antenatal clinics or GP surgeries, and in that respect, educate pregnant women um, or even the public. So we have we kind of like it's all very novel at the moment, but we're thinking of developing a digital educational resource that can be um, that can be accessed um, by the public and hopefully educate them about teratogens and then about fetal alcohol and drug affection uh, drug affected um, syndrome. Which should be very effective. Um, okay, our second question. Um, the uh, students indicated that the simulators could be useful at the booking appointment. Uh, have, we, have we done that once, uh, Louise? Yeah. Has that been covered? Yeah, we've more or less done them all now. Just oh, we've done them all. Okay. I wanted to respond to Shelley Harris Studdard talking with women before pregnancy. I would agree with that uh, entirely. Preconceptual care is really important. And Homer and I were thinking about taking these simulators into school and talking to um, sixth form a young men and young women about um, the, you know, the, the, the effects of teratogen. So I think it does need to be before pregnancy. Many women who are pregnant often um, don't know that they're pregnant and are still drinking or taking drugs or whatever it is. So, um, so there's so much to do with these simulators. Absolutely. And I'm just answering a question somebody put forward about the looking at um, Indian uh, use of betel nut. In fact, um, I'm, I've got my MSc student who's doing a scoping review on that. And, um, and I'm planning to um, go out to Pakistan if I get the funding for it. I've got connections with the Pakistani midwifery network and um, they are really interested in um, training their midwives um, around fetal alcohol and um, and especially the drug affected doll to look at the impact of teratogens such as betel nut and smokeless tobacco use from palm um, on um, on the baby there hasn't been much research carried out on the fetal outcomes so all i can say is watch this space and if you're interested email me yeah put the slide up with our who's got the um put the slide up with our details on it okay there you go you have, our, so, you have our addresses here if you wish to contact us we'd love to hear from you um, if you have any ideas, if, any any ways of collaborating, uh, research collaboration would be fantastic. Um, so, do you want to ask us any questions? Oh, pleasure, Carol. Um, uh, I'd like to ask a question uh, to both of you. Mm -hmm. or uh, a, a comment actually it's not a question it's a comment on the, somebody has just said something like women in nigeria will not accept publicly uh, that they consume alcohol i don't know what, whether you'd want to make a comment about that um i think obviously okay so what happens at the booking appointment then in um, in nigeria then do they uh, do they have to admit it then Hello, Carol. Hello. Hello. So I was Hello. saying oh, that at the booking appointment, do they not have to admit alcohol consumption then? Um, it's it's it, it's a comment I have seen from somebody by the name Muf Anita, who mm -hmm. says that women in Nigeria will not accept publicly that they consume alcohol. I don't know whether Anita would like to say something about it, or maybe she would probably want to talk to you offline after this. Yeah, because I, I, I mean, you know, women don't have to don't have to say admit to anything if they feel they're going to be censored by the um the the, the healthcare professional. So it's better to have a relationship with these uh, women before you ask start asking invasive questions. In the UK, that you are you have to ask at the booking appointment whether a woman consumes alcohol. Whether she admits to that is you know an entirely individual perspective. So not all women will say yes, or not all women will. Will own up to it so we just have to build up relationships with women so that they trust us and are able to confide in us if um, if they are abusing uh, particular substances yes absolutely um, i'm just um, responding to um Olo Wukira's comment about the idea of cultural um, taboos. Um, it, it, obviously, the same in Pakistan and India and Bangladesh. Obviously, drinking alcohol, um, women are not, not supposed to do that, or even smoking cigarettes. But yet, what they're not understanding is that the impact of smokeless tobacco 
um, is just as dangerous to the baby and their own health um, in terms of, you know, sudden infant death syndromes or uh, prenatal, pre, you know, prenatal stillbirth and all that sort of thing. There's all sorts of problems that occur. Um, uh, even from that or from passive smoking, doing research around um, passive smoking and the impact on the baby as well. So um, it, it, I think Louise's point is correct. You have to really do build that rapport up with the with the lady in front of you. Um, but here in the UK, booking appointment, you normally there's the questionnaire you go through um, where you... Um, you hope that for the sake of the child, the, the baby, and for the health, out, better health outcomes that the woman admits to smoking or drinking. So, um, yes, I agree culturally, it can be quite difficult. I believe we have to close the session now, is that correct? Yeah, I think we can now wrap up. Thank you very much, uh, Louisa and Humaira. We really appreciate that very, very interesting and um, thought-provoking presentation we appreciate so much thank you for the it, opportunity to thank you research. so much really appreciate it it's been a really interesting to, and to answer your questions and to present our research thank you for the opportunity